Welcome to Queries, Qualms, and Quirks, the twice a month podcast that asks published authors to share their successful query letter and discuss their journey from first spark to day of publication. I am your host, author Sarah Nicholas and literary agent Sarah N. Fisk. Nora Fessner has a BA from Sarah Lawrence College and an MFA from CUNY Brooklyn College. Her debut novel, The Invisible World, was published by Vintage in September 2023. Other work has appeared in Lit Hub, Crime Reads, Longleaf Review, Brooklyn Review, and Electric Literature. She lives in Pittsburgh. So please welcome Nora to the show. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having me. Hi. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm really excited. So for the listeners who didn't listen to the last episode, we interviewed your sister for the last episode. And now we're going to talk to you. I just think it's really interesting that y'all both debuted in the same year, but have very different journeys to publication. So I'm really excited to talk to you. Yeah, the same year. It's wild how it happened that way. (laughs) All right. So we are going to talk about your journey to publication. And we're going to start by going all the way back to the beginning. When did you first start getting interested in writing? And then how long did it take before you started getting serious about pursuing publication? I've been writing my entire life, I'm sure, like many writers, you know, since I was six years old, writing little stories. I took my first writing workshop as a freshman in college at Sarah Lawrence, and I never looked back. I didn't get serious about publication until after college. That's when I started sending out short stories to literary journals and really pursuing publication in that way. Awesome. So how did you learn more about the publishing industry, like how it works, how to query, all that different stuff? In grad school. So when I was at Brooklyn College, at least once a semester, they would have agents come and talk to us, talk about the querying process, answer our questions. And then we also had a nice opportunity to do a kind of one-on-one like pitch session. So I remember I met with Jenny Ferrari Adler and she looked at my query draft. And I made a rookie mistake. I was working on a novel. I brought her the second chapter because I was not happy with the first (laughs) chapter. I was still like, no, I need to revise it. And she was very nice, but she was like, "Uh, yeah, I'm not going to read the second chapter of your book. Mm -hmm. Like you have to you have to send me the first chapter. So that was my first important lesson. So that's when I learned about, you know, how to write a query letter and all of that. Awesome. So then what happened? Can you break down for us your journey from then to signing your first book contract? Yeah. So I was working on a novel in grad school. That was my master's thesis. After grad school, I continued to revise it for a year or two, and then I started to send it out. And I queried for probably two years. I reached out to all of the agents who had come, you know, to Brooklyn College who I had met with. And I did a lot of like cold querying. I got close with an agent and then she ghosted me. And that was the kind of final nail in the coffin, unfortunately. Like I'd been at it for two years. Yeah. And then, you know, not hearing from this person right before, quote, the call, you know, I just I, I couldn't do it anymore. In retrospect, that book was not done. I mean, I think one of the most important lessons I learned is that just because you are sick of something doesn't mean it's actually finished. (laughs) So I, in the meantime, while I was querying that book, I was working on The Invisible World. And I wrote it for like seven or eight years, just really focused on it. And then I started the querying process before the book was done by going to conferences again and paying for these pitch sessions with agents just to get some kind of initial feedback. How is it, you know, how is it coming across? Is my elevator pitch solid? That kind of thing. And I met one really nice agent at BinderCon, which I don't know if that even exists anymore, but she ended up asking for an R&R. She didn't end up signing me. But it was like I made really good revisions. The book definitely got better because of that. And then in the summer of 2019, I had a really, really boring temp job. I had to be there 40 hours a week. I think on an average week, I had about three to five hours of actual work to do. Mm -hmm. And so I used all of that time to research agents and put together these queries, I made this list of 25 agents who I was confident would be at least interested in the book based on what they said on their Twitter profiles and, you know, agency pages. And so 
I queried all of those agents by Labor Day. And then my agent was in that that stack. Awesome. So then you signed with your agent. And then did you go on sub right away? Did you revise before you went out on sub? No, we revised. We revised for, I think, close to a year. Mm. Uh, we did a couple rounds of revision. Um, my agent's very hands-on editorially. So we did like a big developmental edit and then a couple shorter like line edit rounds. And then we went on sub for, uh, we were on sub for 18 months, which was pretty rough. We went through three mm. rounds of submission before yeah. we got an offer from Vintage. Awesome. It is time for the first cue of the podcast. Can you read your successful query letter for us? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dear agent, I saw on your submission page that you were looking for books with, quote, compelling, complex female characters. I think that nicely describes my novel, The Invisible World. Eve and Ryan Hawthorne, a young married couple living in a small Pennsylvania town, believe their house may be haunted and contact a paranormal reality show to investigate. For five days and nights, the crew of Searching for the Invisible World interviews Eve and Ryan and films their home. They bring in a ghost hunting team and a psychic and experience a range of activity, banging on the walls, shelves collapsing without being touched. But the activity eludes capture even as it intensifies, and over the course of the week, the tension grows between the Hawthorns and the show's crew. Three women are at the heart of the book. Eve, a frustrated artist who has experienced supernatural activity all her life, Sandra, the Invisible World's beleaguered producer, and Caitlin, the 15-year-old member of the Paranormal Investigators of Pennsylvania, a sensitive girl who has invested her hopes for the future in both being on TV and making contact with the other side. These women and the men closest to them have sublimated their desires to the point where those desires burst through to the surface of the world, proving that a house is only as haunted as its residents want it to be. Feminist and witchy, Complete at 72,000 words, The Invisible World is for fans of The Heavens by Sandra Newman or Her Body and Other Parties by Carmen Maria Machado. I received my MFA from Brooklyn College, where I was a recipient of the Hyman Brown Award for my short story, The Now. My story, Like Disaster, was chosen as a top 25 in Glimmer Train's short story award for new writers and was subsequently published by Longleaf Review. My fiction, nonfiction, and reviews have appeared in the Brooklyn Review, New York Press, The Millions, and Electric Literature. I have a BA from Sarah Lawrence College and currently teach at the University of Pittsburgh. I have pasted below the first 20 pages and complete synopsis of The Invisible World. If you'd like to read more of the manuscript, I'd be delighted to send it. Thank you for your time and consideration. Sincerely, Nora Fussner. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Sure. Yeah. So how has your experience been since signing that first contract? Especially let us know like what really surprised you along the way. The experience has been good. My experience with Vintage, I would say, was very positive. I really, I loved my editor. The marketing team all seemed very enthusiastic about it. I don't, this is a weird one. I don't know if this is exactly <laughs> what your listeners would expect. But in terms of surprises, I will say holding the physical book in my hand with like less of the huge climactic moments mm. that I was expecting, I think because I had looked at the book in so many forms, right? We had done two rounds of like proofreading and I had had the arcs and I had seen the PDF and I had approved the cover. And so like I had constructed this book in my mind in so many ways that when I finally got the copy, I was like, yep, there it is. You know, <laughs> I didn't do like an unboxing video where I cried or anything because I was like yeah. it's exactly what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny because I do feel the same way. Like I definitely have seen like these very tearful unboxing videos. And maybe it's just because I'm a minimalist and I don't put a lot of like, you know, heavy weight on physical things. But when I saw my book for the first time in print, I was like, OK, that's it. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, it is time for the quick round. I call it author DNA. Are you a pantser or a plotter? Pantser. Do you tend to be an overwriter or an underwriter? Overwriter. Do you prefer to write in the morning or at night? Morning. When you start a new project, do you typically start with character, plot, concept, or something else first? Concept. Do you prefer coffee or tea? Tea. When writing, do you prefer silence or some kind of sound? Silence. When it comes to the first draft, are you a get it down kind of person or a get it right kind of person? Get it down. What tools or software do you use to draft? 
only pages because I like how it doesn't, it's not quite as, in, as invasive as Microsoft like Word. Do you prefer drafting or revising more? I, I think I prefer drafting, but I know that the real work is in revision. Do you write in sequential order or do you hop around? Mostly sequentially. And final quick round question. Are you an extrovert or an introvert? Oh, introvert. Definitely. All right. Now we're going to talk about the second cue of the podcast. What were some of the qualms or worries that you had in your journey? And do you feel like they were realized or you overcame them or how did they shake out? I was definitely worried going into publication that my book was just going to kind of disappear in the sea of books that come mm -hmm. out in the fall. I was really excited for the fall release. But then I realized I was literally competing with Sadie Smith and Lauren Gross <laughs> and all of these like huge, huge books at the same time. And in fact, you know, my book, as happy as I am with how everything went, my book was on no most anticipated lists mm -hmm. and it was on no year end best of lists. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, my like fear sort of came true. <laughs> um, I got a really wonderful review in the New York Times Sunday Book Review, which was mm -hmm. great. But other than that, literally nothing like I didn't get like local coverage in the newspaper in Pittsburgh or anything. But I think that I overcame it because, you know, the path to publication for me was so long that part of me just wanted everything all at once in case it never happened again. Mm. And my agent is very interested in supporting me over my whole career. And so I had to kind of take a step back and be like, OK, you're not the best novelist in America with your first novel, right? You have to <laughs> leave leave some room to grow here. Let the second book be a little bit anticipated and, you know, see what happens. Nice. And the third cue of the podcast, do you have any writing quirks? Is there anything about your writing process that you think is kind of different or interesting or unique? I always like a scented candle when I write. And uh, chocolate, you know, one thing that I will like go to Whole Foods and buy a bunch of kind of expensive chocolate, you know, five or six bars to last me several months. So the the candle and the chocolate are really an integral part of the process. Awesome. You're actually the second person to mention a candle. The first was uh, Mia Manazzola. Oh, nice. Yeah. When you were in the lowest parts of your journey, what kept you going and why did you stick with it? I really believe in the story. I really, I got very attached to my characters and I thought I was saying something interesting. I mean, at the lowest parts, I thought I was saying something idiotic, but like deeper, you know, deeper than that, I really felt like I do have this story to tell. And so sometimes you have to just write for writing's sake, even if no one's ever going to read it. Yeah. Do you feel like you made any mistakes along the way that you'd like to, you know, let listeners know about so maybe they can try to avoid the same ones? Yeah, definitely with my first book, sending it out before it was done because I didn't want to look at it anymore. And six months after I'd stopped querying, I went back and I read it and I was like, this book is a mess. <laughs> and it's amazing that an agent even wanted to have the call at all, whether she ghosted me or not, because this book is a mess. And so with The Invisible World, I was much more patient with myself and just like, okay, I will step away from it for a few months. I will have friends read it and give me feedback. But just because I don't want to look at it doesn't mean that it's done. And like in the last, I, I kind of went in the other direction because with The Invisible World, I showed it to a friend and he was like, okay, it's done. Send it out. And I was like, okay, I'm going to revise it one more time. <laughs> yeah. I did want to mention, because you had mentioned going to conferences and kind of like pitching agents before the book was really ready and getting feedback on it. And I always get that question of like, is it okay to do a pitch session at a conference if the book's not ready yet? Because most people know don't query if it's not ready yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I always think that it is because I think that if you do have the opportunity to get face-to-face -face time with an agent, even if the book's not ready yet, it can still be really valuable for you to get, you know, that immediate feedback and get your questions answered and that kind of thing. So I always encourage people that if you do have the opportunity to do it, then go, go for it, you know, do it anyway. Yeah. None of the agents seemed to mind. I was very yeah. forthcoming. I said, look, the book's not done. And they said, that's fine. And one thing that, you know, I'm sure you've told your listeners is that agents remember you, right? So you email them later and you say, we met at the Slice conference six months ago. Um, I always got a reply to those messages. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's still book one book that I'm waiting to hear from Sleuth Fest, which was like last summer, I think. So if you're listening, please send that to me. Okay. <laughs> Can you share with listeners one of the most important lessons you learned on your journey to publication? It takes as long as it takes. And if it's not happening now, that doesn't mean it's never going to happen. And with my agent too, like we talked about how long the submission process was taking. And she mm. said, you know, just trust the process. So even if it's not happening now, that doesn't mean it will never happen. Mm -hmm. I call this the acknowledgements portion of the podcast. This is not a business that most of us succeed in completely on our own. Who are some of the people who helped you along the way and how? Oh, yeah. I mean, I have wonderful beta readers, some folks who have been reading my work since college, which was 20 years ago. Uh, so I'm very grateful for my friends who gave me feedback, particularly friends who read multiple drafts, which I, I've read plenty of my friends' books. Um, I can't say that I really want to read multiple drafts of their books, like after I've given them feedback once. <laughs> so I'm very appreciative of friends who read multiple drafts of The Invisible World for me. So I went to a wonderful summer at the Colgate Writers Conference, and I was in a novel workshop before the book was done, and that was great. Brian Hall led the workshop, and he and the other five novelists in the workshop gave me great feedback as well. It was a really supportive environment, and that was instrumental in kind of finishing the book. And I always have to thank my husband as well, who is very supportive, but also took me on a ghost hunt in an abandoned mental asylum in West Virginia in the middle of the night, which was some research that I needed to do. And he was game for it. So absolutely, I wouldn't have been able to finish the book without that. Awesome. I love that. Nora, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your story with my listeners. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was so fun. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Queries, Qualms, and Quirks. You can find the text of Nora's query in the show notes, along with links to find out more about her and her books. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate if you'd help me find new listeners by leaving a review, telling your friends, or sharing this episode on social media. If you're interested in supporting the show, go to patreon.com slash Sarah Nicholas. That is Sarah with an H and Nicholas with no H. And if you're a published author interested in being a guest on the show, please click on the home base link in the description or go to sarahnicholas.com and click on the podcast logo in the sidebar. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.